This is the Venture Capital Fast Lane. I am your host, Ryan Else, managing partner of Roadster Capital. In the Venture Capital Fast Lane, we will talk about all things fast in venture capital and everything that surrounds it. If it's fast, we're going to talk about it. Growth, exits, funding, cars, rockets, data, software, and much more. We are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. So buckle up. This is the Venture Capital Fast Lane. All right. Well, welcome back to the Venture Capital Fast Lane. In today's episode, we're going to talk about ratings frameworks for VC funds with Eric Wu of Revere VC. So Eric is the co-founder and CEO of Revere, where he leads product development, investment analysis, and due diligence efforts. Prior to starting Revere, he was head of institutional capital at AngelList, the world's largest on online venture capital investment platform that supports $10 billion in assets and has facilitated investments in 190 unicorns. At AngelList, Eric worked closely with investors to curate early stage fund and deal opportunities. He also developed uh, systematic and data-driven strategies for institutional investors. So over the past 12 years, uh, Eric has helped allocate over $160 million into venture funds and direct co-investments. And I think most notably, he played a key role in establishing the Emerging Manager Investment Programs at Top Tier Capital and Northgate Capital, both organizations that collectively have more than $15 billion in AUM. And Eric is an acknowledged thought leader in the VC Emerging Manager ecosystem. He graduated from UC Berkeley, Go Bears, and he has been a CFA charter holder since 2004. Eric, welcome to the Venture Capital Fast Lane. Thank you, Ryan. Glad to be here. And I am buckled up, ready to go. Well, it's great to have you here today and talk about River, uh, Revere and catch up because you and I have a lot of catching up to do and you have been very busy. So, you know, I remember the first time that you and I met, you had just returned from a trip to Hong Kong and some business in the U.S. were putting up signs in the lobbies asking people not to shake hands. A lot of people were kind of skeptical of what was going on, and COVID was barely on the radar here in North America. But that wave of disruption that came after that was unlike anything our world has seen. And you were preparing for a career transition long before the great resignation really set in. And this became Revere, a company that you co-founded with Chris Shen. So will you tell me and our audience about that aha moment that led you guys to start this company and how it came to be what it is today? Yeah, I, I think um, I wouldn't be doing it full service as a, as a founder and CEO if I didn't admit that this was actually pivot number three for us. Uh, and as often the times with other founder journeys, you, you identify a problem, you've lived through it, you've experienced it, and you say, gosh, you know, if there's no one else who's doing something about this, I, I should be the one doing it, right? And when you caught me at Angelus, we were going through essentially the throes of a whole new generation of syndicate lead investors, emerging fund managers, and they were having a tremendously difficult time raising their funds in large part because you had this disconnect between let's just call it family offices, institutional investors, and how do they get that translation out to that LP audience? And so Revere in its, uh, in its journey really started with this concept of talent in the emerging manager category is looking for capital and that capital wants to find shortcuts to identifying those fund managers. That is a premise and the how is really this concept of what we think is a tool, a toolkit for evaluating emerging fund managers. And so a lot of what we went through in the early days at Revere was you know, exploring marketplace models. We had um, our own you know, fund of funds or baskets as we called it. We were trying to kind of play with that idea but at the end of the day, we identified that the root cause problem is people just, there's just not enough transparency and there's not enough tools, expert tools to evaluate fund managers. And so that's what we come up with. Um, and that's why we call ourselves the morning star for VC. It's the ratings framework. It's providing our expert due diligence and packaging it together 
So it's approachable, digestible for a whole wide audience of different types of allocators. Well, I like that. The Morning Star. Uh, I think that's a really great reference. You know, when, where are you all at in the fundraising process with Revere? Do you have any notable investors or customers that you can speak about? Yeah, so we, we closed a, a seed round earlier this year. So in concert with the crystallization of um, us building a data mode and really signal in the marketplace of the Morningstar model, um, we were able to convince um, some believers here in the venture ecosystem, as well as prominent angels and some family offices to um, accelerate uh, that model. Um, and so we closed the seed round in March of 2022. A lot of that uh, capital is going toward obviously hiring. Uh, we've got eight full-time people now uh, growing the team. Uh, the product you know, beta version is built, um, continued product development on that side. And a lot of really, if you think about venture capital as an asset class, you've just got to get in front of the customer, right? So marketing dollars going to conferences, a large category of investors that we're approaching are private wealth and registered investment advisors, right? So that entire community relies on relationships and face-to-face, -face, right? And so some of our capital will be going uh, toward efforts there to um, promote and broadcast what we're working on to that audience. Yeah, I've noticed you you and Chris and the rest of your team have been quite busy you know, circling, circling everyone and uh, putting together a few of your own unique events that, that really focus on bringing together those wealth managers, family offices, and emerging managers in, in social events that allow for, for you to really speak to the benefit of what you're doing and show how you can connect them offline and online through your service. Yeah, and, and it's, it's about building trust and credibility. I think in a, in a category like early stage venture where you don't have the reams of data and information and track record from let's say like the hedge fund world. And so you really have to rely on personalities and narratives to come through. Uh, and Ryan, you know this as um, a fund manager yourself. So if we can activate that ecosystem on both sides, but do it in a fashion where our brand is known for trust and credibility with the integrity of our rating system and providing greater transparency, this is really what those events are intended to do is to help accelerate how those connections can happen and do it in a thoughtful way. Yeah, you know, I, I like to always stick with the with the mantra of, Pace of execution wins deals, but you also must build trust and transparency along the way. And so when introducing uh, an emerging manager, let's say, who's out raising a fund, they need people to, to give them clear answers and not drag them along for too long because they have a lot on the line building this fund up. But if, they're, if they don't meet the definition as you will, of emerging manager, meaning having deployed capital with a another notable fund in the past. Um, it can be really challenging to even get a meeting with a family office or a fund of funds or the like. So if a team like yours can come together and do some of that diligence ahead of time and with your existing credibility and street cred, if you will, bring the, bring the right people, the right talent forward, then we start to have a an ecosystem that that builds based on uh, true capability. It, it's um, it's funny internally we we talk about small wins, right? And I think this is going to feel commonplace for a lot of other startup founders who who may be listening to this. And what we think of as the small wins that we want to accomplish in the near term is really this concept of how can we eliminate those first and second time meetings between LPs and emerging fund managers, right? It's the awkward, hey, what do you do? You're going through the pitch deck, you're trying to articulate differentiation and in the back of the LP mind, they, they could be saying, well, I don't think this is differentiated at all. And so if you think about Revere's platform, the coverage of the funds that we have rated in the very, very long and large pipeline of additional funds that we will be rating, that coverage and the digestibility of a short, concise, but very institutional due diligence ratings report should hopefully eliminate those for first and second meetings. So 
Um, and that's a, in my book, that's a win-win for both the GPs and the LPs in this community. Yeah, I think it ought to be. And, you know, there, there is a, there are a lot of funds coming to market. So I would think you have a, a lot of kind of parsing through the weeds to find those best of breed opportunities. There's probably no shortage of opportunities for you to look at, but finding those, those real potential outliers that can deliver alpha in, in ways that others can't, that's going to be a challenge. But I, I think you guys have done it enough already in your uh, past working experience to where you could really um, deliver that, that solution set. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is um, solving the, the problem of standardization. And, you know, I, I will readily admit, you know, you can send a bunch of funds my way and, and I can, quickly identify the pros and cons, right? So in this, in this category, everyone's got a unique story. Everyone's got a value proposition. This is why they're in the business of raising a fund. This is why founders love working with them. Many of them are specialized, right? So a, a deep tech early stage fund should exist alongside a B2B SaaS investor, right? So a lot of what we try to do is standardize the language and the terminology through our ratings process to help LPs do that apples to apples comparison, right? And that standardization is a combination of the years that I worked as an institution allocator. And every time I had to utilize my template as an investment memo and also argue and advocate and build conviction around that fund manager to my investment committee, the net result of all that effort, all that work, all that pattern recognition, all that processing power, if you will, that's what, it, that's what our ratings reports are, right? Is that standardization of that framework that we've, myself and my co-founder, Chris, that we've developed over the years. Yeah, I think that really gets to the heart of what my next question is, which was, why is it important to offer a ratings framework on VC funds and how do you truly convey that to your target customer base? I think, you know, you've, you kind of highlighted on it, but could you just really drill into that just a little bit deeper for everyone to hear? Yeah, I think it's, everyone has their own navigation map of how they get from point A, which is, you know, I, I, I want to do early stage investing and, and I'm generally convinced that I want to do it through fund managers. And then how do I actually get that capital to work, right? So the whole navigation map, if you ask one LP and versus another LP, they all have their own maps, right? So everyone is using a non-standard version of this kind of mapping system. And so we think about what Revere does is some form of the operating system of saying, hey, if you're going to start your journey to discover and track and follow early stage funds and, you know, in our category of emerging managers, it's a one through kind of four, generally a small fund, less than hundred, hundred fifty million million. We want to be the starting point of that journey, right? And if we can catch people at the starting point and then synergize them toward a similar kind of mind map of, okay, let me go through the review ratings reports. Let me go and identify which of those funds fit my mandate. And then I can shortlist those funds that I think will be a good fit and then have the conversation, right? As you hear me describe this, now you can see how this maps really neatly into a journey, a step one, a step two, and step three. And if we can do that at scale, then now all of a sudden we've saved people time, we've saved them energy, and we've really created a shortcut to that process of fund managers getting capital. Yeah, because venture capital comes in all shapes and sizes and LPs really have to do significant due diligence to find funds that align with their mandates. Some of them, the smaller LPs don't necessarily have mandates, but you can help them with discoverability of what these opportunities might be. So you mentioned just now that uh, a size that you were looking at in venture funds, could you kind of say, tell us what type of VC funds is Reaver focused on, uh, on serving? Yeah, I think, for, for us, we, we, we like the early stage category because I think that's number one, where there's alpha generation in the asset class. And number two, this is, and this, this is a really important point given the volatility that we've experienced here. This is also the space that is very, is the least correlated to public markets, right? Because right. every investment you're making in a C stage company, I mean, the projected exit is six or seven years. 
um, which offers for those long-term investors a great way to diversify out of short-term um, capitulation, if you will. So, um, so we like early stage venture capital funds. Um, we work with a lot of fund ones and fund twos. We also work with threes and fours, right? So people who are moving out of that, let's just call it experimental pilot phase and now are becoming very institutional. And so the remapping of their LP base away from individuals to more institutions, they also are kind of reinventing themselves, right? And the story has to be reinvented. So we also like working on that end of the range too, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the guidance, the advice, the value we're providing is translating to those GPs. You know, that end of the range is, is a key component that I would think most don't think about early on. I mean, you all you often hear about an emerging manager going out and saying, well, I'm just going to raise this fund from some people I worked with at name your tech company. Um, and they, in most cases, fund size doesn't allow them to raise from an institution. And in most cases, they don't have contacts at the institutions. But if your AUM grows accordingly from fund one through three, and you've proven your method, you do need a helping hand to help you best understand which LPs you ought to be going after in that institutional world. And it is a very different world uh, to where you're dealing with, um, you know, university endowments and state governing boards and the like that are managing billions of dollars in AUM and the minimum check size they can write is 10 million, right? So it's a whole different uh, breed of animal, if you will. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and again, they need to be similarly serviced in a different way compared to let's say a family office investor or a private wealth advisor in the Midwest, right? But they still have the same fundamental problem. It's hard to get coverage and it's hard to perform due diligence on this part of the, the ecosystem, right? So um, we, as a startup, are going through this go-to-market journey and we're discovering these very unique um, use cases of different types of customer personas and how can we adapt um, our product orientation, even just simple things like the navigation of our, our platform experience. How can we adapt that to the different sets of audiences. And so I think this is an important point because you can only really um, have these solutions if you're building something from the ground up, right? If you think about a traditional fund of funds or you think about a crowdfunding platform, it is very, very siloed to a specific, specific customer, right? And what we have the benefit starting with the data play and the platform play using tech enablement, we can actually address multiple use cases according to this common problem of how do I find these great, great talented fund managers. Yeah, and, you, and you're gonna have some really interesting feedback loops because the, the early adopters of this framework will, will be able to, to truly give you that real value added feedback and, and you have the ability to listen within your team to, to further refine what Revere offers. Yeah, and, 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 and that's, the, that's the great thing about sort of being a, a founder CEO is you get to um, take those feedback loops and make them actionable. And um, just to give you an example, I mean, the, the two types of customers that have been the first paying customers we've had, um, a couple folks on the very institutional side, you know, outsource consultants and OCIOs who you know, have done venture, are sophisticated, have their own internal teams and process, but they recognize that we've become an additive layer to that assessment, right? It really takes two or three turns at this two or three uh, viewpoints and perspective to really identify who are the one or two fund managers that they want to be adding to a portfolio. Because as you mentioned, most pensions and endowments, they're not doing an active um, program where they're adding five or six relationships a year, right? So they have to be very, very selective. So we become an independent voice in that consideration. And then the other side of it is we've had um, family offices and individual investors who, who I would say um, love the fact that 
we can really sit there and be an engine for them, right? Engine meaning sourcing and due diligence. It's just, it's all there. It's all available. It's all digital, right? So um, for a lot of those family office clients, they see us as essentially just being an extension of their team or replacing somebody that they would have to spend six months trying to hire and train up. So yeah. the, um, the cost for them there is it makes a lot of sense then to buy into your solution because if, if you could, in essence, reduce their overhead cost um, and bring them significantly greater value and visibility far beyond what one person can see at a desk, why wouldn't you give it a shot? And, and, the, and the key um, commonality between those, those two um, early use cases is we are not advocating for them to give us capital to make the decisions for them, right? So um, the larger play here um, around sort of democratization of, of alternative assets, and obviously um, some of this is kind of inspired by my time at AngelList, but giving people choice along with the tools to make the informed decision it's a huge, huge movement, right? And it's not going away. And you have so much capital that is yearning for those tools. Um, so, so that's something as a, as a fundamental principle and philosophy of us building this business is we want to give sort of the power to make decisions um, kind of back in the hands of these, these clients that we work with and the allocators, right? Where for too long, venture was something where they had to go and, and, and buy access through someone else, right? And I think this is all changing very, very rapidly. Yeah, you know, I think for me, uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum as an, as an emerging manager, when I speak with potential LPs, after having gone through the ringer a numerous amount of times and had a lot of different meetings, it, eventually you come to be able to identify which LP is truly interested in doing something actionable and they'll start to ask you questions that that others just don't. You know, they'll ask you, uh, "How are you looking at uh, portfolio construction? Or what type of reserves do you, what do you plan to have in your fund? How many uh, companies do you want to have in in your target uh, fund size?" And when they start asking those questions and drilling in, then you know you've got a a good fish on the line, if you will. And then you you really give them the time and attention necessary in order to if not rope them into your fund today, build that relationship for tomorrow. And I would think that the, the LPs that you're in conversations with are the ones who want to ask those questions with greater, free, greater frequency, but they just don't have a tool to do that. And it seems to me as if Revere is that tool. Yeah, and it's, it, it's really interesting you bring this up because I actually think, um, I mean, look, LPs are humans, right? And they're bombarded. They have more work. They have more managers and slots that they can actually invest in. And so a lot of, you know, having been a former LP, but also understanding what they're thinking, there's a vulnerability there, right? They, they don't want to admit that they need help, right? And we come in with a solution and an approach that says, you know what, we're here to help, right? We're, we're here to be part of that toolkit. And so when you talk about the behavior of how LPs essentially um, demonstrate their interest in fund managers, we're simply helping to hopefully replace that front end of that discovery process because the discovery process for you as a fund manager, for an LP, it's, it's, it's painful, it's time consuming. And by having our standard framework and by having us be the go-between, we think that's really what the LPs are looking for, is they want to basically go to a platform, you know, go to an organization like Revere and be able to say like, you know what, I don't have good coverage, or I think I'm missing something within that coverage, or I think I've got good coverage, but I need a second opinion, right? So we've actually had some of these LPs say, well, you know what, you know, I don't do a lot of, you know, emerging fund managers or new relationships. So I may not be a fit to kind of subscribe and just get your whole um, kind of all you can eat. But, you know, I've got three funds and two of them are re-ups and one of them is a new relationship through my existing sourcing channel. Can you go and rate these three funds and provide a second opinion? 
And absolutely, right? And so um, it just further demonstrates that if you can humanize and associate with the, the, the LP instead of being this kind of like, well, they're on that side of you know the fence and I'm on this side of the fence. That's really what we think is the powerful um, and unique nature of what we're building, which, you know, in our opinion, um, that's the first principles kind of element of this, which I think could be very, very powerful. Okay. So, so that, that's kind of interesting. That's quite interesting. So it kind of brings me to another question. Um, so in retail, uh, when you're selling consumer, consumer products to a, a buyer, you know, more often than not, it's hard to get that first meeting because if you are starting out with only one item, that's one SKU or SKU as they call it. And more, they always need to have at least three SKUs so they can pick and choose and then present it to their, their buyers and get buy off. And the same is kind of in software where they're looking oftentimes for multiple flavors, which you touched on earlier. So how, how do you, um, how do you see yourself creating a, these multiple offerings? Like, are you just listening to them and saying, all right, that's one more offering we can do more of a consultative piece of our offering? Yeah. So it's, um, it's an interesting analogy. And if I were to kind of um, role play here, I think the SKUs really for us are all the fund managers we have on the platform or in the pipeline. And ultimately um, you know, you're, you're the end product that we're trying to get connected to the right um, target audience. So what we have discovered in the throes of, you know, building our product, finding product market fit is just because you have high volume of SKUs doesn't mean that's why people are coming to you, right? Because actually there's a lot of people that say, I don't even know if I want to just go into the store, right? There's some, you know, the power user says, you know what, I, I know exactly what I want and I want to go to a place where I can kind of see all the different flavors and then go in and, and put that in my shopping shopping cart, if you will. But you have some people who are kind of on the outside looking in. They're like, well, I don't even know if if I should be going into that store, right? And, and they need to be, uh, you need to hold their hand a little bit more. They're still in that education phase. They're in the learning phase. And so um, this is an important element for Revere is to be an important content generator to help um, get people comfortable with the asset class. Because I actually don't think it's your job, right? Your job is to sell your unique value proposition and why you're going to make money. But so often you hear fund managers when they meet LPs who are in the discovery learning phase, trying to convince them why VC, right? And I think that's part of the problem. And that's part of the problem that we want to solve. And just to kind of put that, that full wrapper around um, this part of the conversation, we think there's just got to be someone who's there building the infrastructure of like this marketplace or, you know, the shopping center, if you will, but also being the attractor of getting those people to come in the doors. Yeah. And, and what you're going to be offering is you're not going to be offering uh, every single uh, LP customer 31 flavors. You're going to curate the you know, best of breed, top, you know, eight, 10 or 12 based on parameters that they give you and that they can complete within your platform. And then you're going to show them of, of the 80 plus or 160 plus funds that we have on our platform. This is what we think are, is your best of breed uh, subset of opportunities that you should be looking at today for your investment tomorrow. Yeah. And I, and I think the curation is, an, it's an interesting word because I think we in the early days thought very, very hard about doing more curation. And the reality is, um, you know, there is no Sequoia, you know, lying in the weeds here in emerging managers. Everyone is a potential Sequoia, right? So um, being overly curative, curative, if you will, in this category actually doesn't, doesn't help the LPs. Um, so you have to find the right balance, right? So you have to give enough of the flavors, you have to have enough coverage, because you want hopefully at some point um, to allow, you know, the LPs to kind of create little thematic baskets, right? I think that's a really interesting kind of phase two concept of when you have enough uh, broad market coverage and enough 
funds within each of these categories, you know, they may, like I said, you know, that shopping cart analogy, go and say, I want the thematic basket of something in, you know, climate tech or, or, or something else. Yeah. So, and you, you might, you might also be able to over time, you could look at this, this basket of emerging managers that you have, and you could start to look for portfolio overlap within all of them, and then really start to fine tune out who's investing in the exact same deals and who's finding those true outliers that no one else is really getting a, a crack at. Yeah, the, 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 the obvious data mode here is, you know, everything from, you know, benchmarking performance, right? So once I have um, a trusted engagement with a fund manager and they're sending me their quarterly or annual reports to get reflected in sort of their ratings process, then I've got underlying information, I've got performance information and I have that at scale this becomes a really important benchmarking tool and data set, right? Um, again, kind of along the lines of a Cambridge Associates or um, AngelList, which is doing a lot more benchmarking. And then you also have, um, as you mentioned, portfolio company drill down, right? Where you can kind of see underlying portfolio company growth. Um, you can see which funds are invested in, in those companies and where, where you have overlap. And a lot of the early feedback we've gotten from some of our LP side customers is exactly what you just described, is they actually say, I was amazed when I you know, did the, the reporting on my fund pro, you know, portfolio and we had more concentration than I thought, or we had more sector exposure than we thought. And so I think the beauty of the basket model in combination with the diversity of a lot of different types of funds that are all specialized in their categories is you can actually truly build what we call in, you know, kind of asset allocator world, like true diversification. Right. And that becomes really, really powerful. Yeah, that is powerful. And now, so in building that power, you have already at like about, correct me if I'm wrong, 80 plus VC funds on the platform. So how are you, how are you getting there and how do you plan to you know, double that? A uh, two-step process, right? So the first step is, you know, we get everyone through something semi-automated where we just get all the information, right? Your data room, your your, your presentation, um, all the materials goes into an automated process just so we can kind of do the front end processing, right? So within that pipeline, right? So when I kind of use that number, 80 funds in the pipeline, most of them have gone through that process. Now, the next step, is really how do we spend the time, apply the kind of human touch of due diligence. Everyone gets on a due diligence call with us. We write the notes, um, we share our draft ratings with the fund managers, give them a chance to review that. And they may say, you know what, I disagree with this particular element of this score. And then we say, well, give us more information, right? Give us case studies, right? So we're very, very transparent with that feedback loop and we get them engaged and make them feel like they're invested in the process. So the second half of that obviously is a little bit more time intensive and does require the human element, the human touch and the judgment. Um, but we've got this, you know, systematized. So start to finish on just the ratings piece, we can get that entire process done in two weeks. Um, so we feel good about that. Um, but when you look at the totality of what the platform looks like today, we've got 20 funds that have been fully rated. Um, we're on a clip of about three to five funds per week. And then we have, you know, that 70, 80 that are going through and they've done that front end of the process. And so hopefully by summer, end of summer, we're going to be pushing kind of north of 50 funds being rated and more than a hundred kind of in the queue in the pipeline to get their profile set up. Are you, are you looking at geographies for these funds? Do you want them in specific geolocations or is it not really relative? Um, I, you know, some of this is informed by what those LPs are looking for. Okay. Um, so I think just by, by sheer volume, the U S is going to be a good place to start. Um, and you, you see everything from kind of the coast to, you know, mid continent funds. Um, we have life sciences funds. We have some web three funds. We have, um, you know, traditional kind of B2B type of funds. So we do see a very, very good mix. Um, Initially, or kind of as our first phase of the go to market, we focus on funds where there's a prior relationship, right? Either mm -hmm. uh, myself or, or, or the team they've invested personally or from their former shops 
or it's a strong referral for somebody we know in the community. So that's probably the best way to kind of get on our radar um, right now. Um, but at some point as we grow the team and we get the flywheel of the process going, um, we would absolutely welcome, you know, you know, any fund manager from anywhere um, to uh, get registered on the platform. Yeah, I would say if you're a fund manager and you're listening to this, you definitely need to uh, check out Revere and uh, just be aware that they're there because they are here to to help you uh, first and foremost uh, as and be your, your support and guide to ensure that you have a more successful fundraise uh, down the line. So, and and also help your firm grow and be be perceived as ready uh, for investment from institutional LPs once your AUM grows. So um, does Reaver charge fund managers a fee for being on the platform? And how do you ensure, uh, I keep saying Reaver, Revere, sorry. And how does Revere ensure that these fund managers are successful in meeting these LPs on the platform? Yeah, we, we don't charge fund managers. Um, we, uh, we value their time, their energy, uh, the effort in, in sharing and being part of our process. And we think um, that is um, investment on their, their side. Uh, so we charge the LPs because we think kind of the expertise, the quality of our diligence and the ability to have essentially a standard process where you can do an apples to apples comparison on different types of funds um, we think there's high value to that. So right now, our revenue model is to charge the LP side. Um, as I mentioned before, um, some are paying through a subscription and some are paying for a one-off. Right. Um, and then, you know, hopefully at some point, you know, we can kind of unlock different feature tiers, right? So there's, as a, as a product-driven company, um, one of the great things from a scale perspective is I can think about those demanded features and then start to build in kind of pricing tiers according to that. What are you What are you all seeing in way of sales cycle to, from first meeting to close with some of these family offices, or wealth managers, or investment managers? Yeah, still early days, um, but the good news, um, and 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 I know this is not going to surprise anyone. It's a very different sales process and cycle when you're selling someone kind of expert research or data, as compared to trying to convince them to give you money. Yeah, of course. So so much shorter. Um, and different, different, uh, I would say different style. It's more of a SaaS playbook, right? You have things like you, know, you do email campaigns and custom landing pages. Um, there's more of a, I call kind of a data element that you can utilize to make that process more efficient. So again, these are all kind of great things about building a software type of business, um, but in general, I would say the folks that we are talking to, usually after the first call, um, we can very clearly know if they'd be interested in just setting up a demo or being um, going through a trial, right? And that's the whole goal here is get them to sign up for a trial, kick the tires, do that for seven days, and then we can kind of reach back out and say, does this make sense for you? Okay, great. Yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense to me. So um, I want to ask you a question about that's more kind of brings brings everything with what's going on in the current markets and ties it to Revere. And so, uh, uh, you know, we've been look analyzing the stock market uh, right now. It appears to be moving towards bear territory. However, today, uh, the S&P was up about 2%. I think it was, it closed right around 4,000. But, you know, the Fed has somewhat been asleep at the wheel, making money really cheap. And they took 75 basis points off of the table recently. They may have overstayed their position on low interest rates and inflation is on the rise in many cases. We don't hear the word transitory anymore. Um, so in many cases, LP liquidity just is not what it was two years ago and demand appears to have been pulled forward and the markets are clearly rebalancing, especially in tech. We're seeing a lot of revaluation. That in turn translates to early stage investing. We're starting to see rebalancing of valuations for some of these uh, tech startups. And so how are LPs that you work with adjusting allocations to fund managers in this market environment? And are they more likely to re-up with an existing GP in lieu of developing new relationships? Or are they timing alloc are they trimming allocations while still selecting new GPs and doing what a lot of us emerging managers feel they should do, which is 
look forward, not look at today's market? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And the way I would respond is I think we're still in the kind of, oh crap uh, moment of, um, I just got to see kind of what's liquid, what's not liquid uh, moment for a lot of LPs. So um, we've got to work through that, which I think is kind of a, a three to six month process, assuming we're kind of in a, uh, a phase where things are, are, are still down to flat. And then at some point, once people have figured out what the current status of their portfolio looks like, and especially in the alternative space, then they can start to get tactical about things. Um, and that's where I start, that's where I believe you'll start to see um, some capital kind of move back into the venture asset class. Um, so that that's the kind of three to six month outlook, but the longer zoom out here is early stage is very, very insulated from any type of capitulation in the public markets, precisely because as we talked about before, um, the liquidity, the exit events for C stage companies or even series A stage companies are happening many years down the road. Yes. And, and I, I mean, right. And here's the other kind of obvious kicker is the types of innovation that you're investing in today. I mean, it's, it's the next Facebook, it's the next Google, it's the next, you know, Tesla, right? So you're, you're, you're fundamentally investing in an innovation trend that doesn't exist in public markets. Yeah. So how is that a bad thing? It's, it's like logically, of course, yeah, you should have some percentage and you may as an LP say, well, maybe it shouldn't be 10%, it should be 5%, but you should absolutely have some exposure here because fundamentally these are huge, huge markets that are yet to be developed. Um, so I think when you put that, uh, those two things together, it's still gonna be a ro very robust environment and um, it's going to shake out what, you know, we all um, laughingly say kind of the tourist investors, right? And so the tourist investors that were chasing the yield based on that, that kind of easy money and seeing kind of the quick returns, um, for the most part, those are the ones that are going to go away. And that's only going to be a healthy thing for, for the entire market. Yeah, I, I could not agree more. I, I, goodbye, tourists, right? So, uh, so let me see here. I wanted to ask you something a little more fun here for, for everybody. It's a question I like to ask. Do you have a favorite movie character or quote? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I, you know, one thing I'll, I'll do and I'll kind of, I'll pick on my co-founder, Chris here. I mean, he's a, he, he was a huge fan growing up watching star Wars. Oh yeah. And, and I, and I, and I was a huge fan growing up and I was a, I was a star Trek fan right so i was a trekkie so we we get a lot of grief from our teammates it says because we have you know we have different personalities it's like oh well chris is the star wars guy and i'm the trekkie guy but um so one of my favorite light side yeah one of my favorite characters and i grew up kind of watching the next generation so you know captain jean-luc picard and um so I've, I've seen all the episodes sometimes multiple times and uh, you know, one of the quotes that I, I've kind of picked up and remember is in one scene, you're trying to penetrate some shield on a planet and then um, Data, who's the android, said, well, I think that's, a, that's, that's impossible to penetrate that shield. And then Jean-Luc Picard says, well, it's impossible until it's not. It is. Right? Impossible. And so, um, so that's, a, I think, kind of a great summary and tagline of kind of this world of startup investing, right? You know, you think about uh, the companies that you're investing in and, um, you know, they're, they're kind of attacking the impossible until it's not. Um, and that's what makes it so exciting. And hopefully um, making that easier to invest in is really our, our goal here at Revere. Huh, that, that's fantastic. Yeah. And a great, a great quote. Uh, those TV episodes of Star Trek were just so much fun to watch for me growing up. I always enjoyed them. Uh, you know, for me, I think um, in for this episode, I'm going to say The Matrix Resurrections 2021. And the reason I want to say that is because the morning when you and I first met, I had flown into SFO from PDX on a 6 a.m. flight, and it was a day trip for me. I only had two meetings scheduled. Um, you were first on my list. And just before our meeting in North Beach over at Angelist HQ, I noticed a film crew was rigging up a crane. And 
I, for some of the, some people listening here don't know, I've worked on a number of films in San Francisco over the years, always as an extra, n- never had a big speaking line or anything. Just, it's something I've always enjoyed doing when I have some free time. And so uh, I approached one of the grips to ask him what film they were working on. And it was the Matrix Resurrections. So when you and I met that morning, it was one of those quintessential red pill, blue pill moments for me. Mm-hmm. And here we are after all these years, right back to yeah. where it all started talking about it on this podcast. And I want to play a real short quit, uh, clip here for everyone to listen to, because who doesn't like a little bit of The Matrix? After all these years, to be going back to where it all started. Back to The Matrix. The sound is just so incredible. Everybody loves it. So I hope you enjoyed that little bit of a uh, walk down memory lane. Absolutely. You know, in talk, talking about memory lane, I want to take a time, a little bit of moment here just to go over something and let everyone know the value that, that you bring, not just to founders, but certainly the value that you will bring over time to, uh, to revere. You know, I came to town to speak with you about setting up a syndicate on AngelList and structuring an SPV. And the company that I was looking to structure that SPV with was called Scylla Money. And it was a real sought out, sought after fintech at the time based here in Portland. And it still is a hot uh, company, as a matter of fact, and they're doing really great. But the morning of our meeting, as I was walking off of my flight, their COO had called me to tell me that my allocation had been cut back. And it was 7.50 in the morning. My day was just getting going. And I thought, oh, shit, I'm off to a really bad start here. And I was kind of shocked. I was a little bit pissed off, but I knew at the end of the day, it's just business. This is nothing personal. And it turns out it really had something to do with the pro rata rights of the pre-seed investors. And they weren't wanting to raise any more money than they had initially set out for. So the bottom line, my allocation that morning before meeting you had gone from 150K down to 50,000 bucks. And in that meeting, I told you about it. And you said, well, Ryan, that's a deal breaker. We, we need to have a minimum 80K for an SPV on AngelList. And you and I know the reasoning for that is the, the cost to set it up. And it just doesn't pencil out if it's anything less than 80K. And I really thought I was out of luck. And a lot of the steam in my day was taken away from me very early in that day. But I stuck to it. I kept going on through our meeting. And you asked me what else I've been working on. And so... I pulled up a presentation uh, of a fund that I was looking to put together, some of my initial thoughts on the fund. And then I also pulled up a slide deck of a company called PSI Quantum Computing. And as you and I were looking at the presentation for PSI Quantum, um, and you noticed who had invested in some, in some of the prior rounds, you looked at me with this kind of like, like struck in the eyes, like starstruck type of look. It, it kind of just seemed like, what is he seeing? And you said to me, hey, can you get an allocation in this company? And I said, well, I could ask for one. I hadn't really thought of it because they were you know, going through a, a B round. And my second meeting that afternoon was with the founder over in Mountain View. And a few hours later, I had lunch with Jeremy O'Brien, the CEO at Cyquantum Computing. And I walked away with a huge, huge allocation. And uh, I called you right back and said, you're not going to believe it. And how do we get it done? Right. What's that? He said, how are we going to get this done now? Yeah. And I'm like, holy crap, how am I going to get this done? So I'm I'm like, I better call Eric and tell him I pulled off a hat trick. And uh, I get you on the phone and we start talking. You say, that's incredible. We're going to make this happen. And you helped me structure that SPV. The AngelList Private Capital Network saw it and they, they were all in. And a few rounds later, this company is now worth $3.15 billion in climbing. And they are really on mark to, to make the world a better place and do really great things with quantum computing. And I, you know, our meeting that morning was really the launch pad and truly set the gears in motion for Roadster Capital and what it is today. And you helped me make it happen. And I just want to take a quick moment here to say thank you. You're you're welcome, and and this is honestly, um, 
you know, why I do what I do is, is, is for moments like these and I and the countless other uh, founder entrepreneurs who turned into fund managers and um, they're out there uh, and they all need help. And um, the reward is just being part of that community. So, um, so I'm very glad I was there to, to help kind of, you know, small influences, but um, have, you know, big ripple effects over time. Yeah, they really do. And I, I, I just, I'm really appreciative of your time. It means a lot. And I think you've become a friend of mine over the last couple of years. So thanks for that. Um, so let me now back on track here. Um, what does the roadmap look for Revere moving forward? I, it seems to me like you guys are on pace to really start knocking it out of the park. Yeah, I, I think, well, um, I'm, I'm all, I'm open ears for, for people who've kind of gone through go to market and, and, and customer segmentation. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a new challenge for me. Uh, it's one that I, you know, we all embrace here at the company. Um, but we've got to go figure out what are those one or two kind of clear customer use cases. How do we, um, you know, sometimes it's as simple as like just go get the first ten paying customers in each of these segments, and then figure out what's repeatable from that. So that's basically the homework for the next, you know, three to four months for us. Um, we we would love to have more fund managers. You know, obviously, you know, it is a little bit time consuming, but you know, you're you're the lifeblood of of what we do. And um, all I can say is, you know, I continue to encourage people who are you know in the process of fundraising or thinking about raising a fund, um, just keep pressing forward. Keep pressing forward. You went through that, Ryan, and it's going to pay off because um, you know you're needed to be the interface with these founders and to be the guiding hand and the capital uh, for these, these great startup companies. So, um, so more of the same. And then hopefully in six months from now, I've got you know kind of recurring revenue and I'm off to figuring out the next phase of growth for Revere. Got it. Yeah, I, I would echo that same sentiment. Do not give up. Um, you know, good things do come to those who wait. Good things come to those who are persistent and uh, have really strong values behind what they're doing. You're, if you're doing it for all the right reasons, uh, and there are reasons that you yourself have conviction within, you've got to persevere. You have to keep pushing forward. Uh, and eventually, even when you think things are about to implode and fall apart, when you least expect it, a seed that you planted six months, eight months, 24 months ago will come back and it will have, it will have grown into something beautiful. And if you have the uh, ability and the vision to see that uh, when it's happening in real time, seize that moment and make it your day. And when you, right when you think it's not going to happen, things are going to get really good. So uh, all you EMs out there, don't give up. So Eric, I want to ask you here one last question uh, before we end our show here. Um, what comes to mind when you think of going fast? Um, um, when I think about going fast, I think about this, um, this paradox of thinking fast, but moving slow. And, and what I mean by that is kind of, you know, I mentioned, we've got a, we had a couple of pivots We're we're figuring out, we're actually creating a new market, right? You know, there doesn't exist this concept of a category of investable, um, decision-making tools, right? Out, you know, in private markets, right? This is Morningstar, it, is, it exists in public markets. So thinking fast means you have to be continuously iterating. You have to be continuously thinking about how can I improve? How can I make it better? What is, what is the other side? What is my customer thinking? Think fast, but don't always have a knee-jerk reaction and move quickly off of that thinking. So that's the paradox, right? So you kind of have to ask yourself a few times, you have to get a few validating data points. And then when it becomes clear, all right, this is something that really is important and we have to move to address it, then you move, right? So that's the move slow part. Well, that's a, that's a great uh, answer. So I would just like to say that that will do it. Thank you, Eric, for driving in the fast lane. Until next time, I'm your host, Ryan Else, and this, is the venture capital fast lane.
Good. Good. All right.